I'm going to give you the breakdown of a chapter all at one time. I'm just going to break it out for you. If you're the person who's writing down the way I do it, then I'll tell you piece by piece how to do it. If you're not doing it the way I do it, it's fine with me, but I'm telling you that's what I'm going to do. So in the next chapter, in chapter 21, verses 1 through 21, I want to take a look at something that I'm calling an encore for a villain. I, you've probably seen this before. The, the villain fights with the hero viciously, and the hero knocks down the villain, and the fight is stopped, and he slinks down as though he's dead, but he's not dead. The hero stands up. His face is beaming because he's just overcome evil. His eyes have met the damsel that he just rescued, and he's looking at her, as his lips give way to a smile, the eyes of the maiden widen, and behind him, the villain is not dead and comes back for another run. You've all seen this. This is a quintessential scene that is, you know, there's always the guy thinks he's dead before he's dead. Why? Why does the hero never check to see that the villain's actually dead? Or, even better, why do villains always create these weird schemes to kill the hero instead of just shooting him dead right then? I mean, seriously, they want this candle to burn through the rope, to drop the ax. I mean, for crying out loud, just kill the guy and let's end the TV series. But the point is, all of a sudden, you know, the guy comes back. How many times have you seen a premature victory? People celebrating a victory before it happens. Just because you believe you solved the problem doesn't mean the problem is solved. And this chapter, 21, 1 to 21, is really about a problem that comes back up from your past. Let me put it in spiritual terms. Maybe you think you've conquered something in your life. And then you get lax in being diligent about it because you think you conquered it in your life. And it comes back with a vengeance. Maybe five years ago, you're, you had a really bad mouth. Like a really bad mouth but you think, I've conquered that, I've got it under control, then all of a sudden, some word comes out of your mouth, and even as it's leaving, you feel that someone else has, you know, taken over your body. You're going, no. <laughs> the truth is, you drop a rock on your foot, and all of a sudden, the most obscene things come out of your mouth, and you haven't said those words in years. You think you conquer something, and sometimes you didn't conquer it at all. Let me, let me set the scene here. I want to break the chapter in three parts. One to eight is setting the scene. One to eight is setting the scene. And it's really going to help us to understand um, the kind of time it was, okay? Then nine to 16 is what I call facing the sting. As strange as it seems, the center episode is not Abraham, and it's not Sarah, it's the maid Hagar. This is going to pick up, Hagar is going to come back into the story with a vengeance. It's going to be, I mean, seriously, it's going to be something you're, you're not expecting this. And that's 9 to 16, 21, 9 to 16. Then facing the sting, 21, 9 to 16. Then the third part is finding the promise. That's 17 to 21. 17 to 21 is finding the promise or God's work in the midst of trouble. I want to get you to the last part because I'm interested in God's work when I'm in trouble. But in order to do that, I got to get you in trouble. To get you in trouble, I got to set the scene. So let's go back to chapter 21, verse 1. I want you to know the kind of time it was. It was a time of outlandish blessing. God was blessing out the yazoo. Verse 1, then the Lord took note of Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken. I, I want you to notice that the Lord took note. Not only was Abraham's unreliability making delay a risk to Sarah, but also the Lord had a promised uh, time to deliver a child. Remember, the, remember what the angel said? Next year I'm going to come by and when I come by she's going to have a baby? So that meant the clock was running on this. So Abraham might have been 
not be doing, not have been doing, yeah, not be doing, he'd not be doing. Abraham was not doing the proper thing by going off into the wilderness and by, by exposing her to Avimelech. But it's also true that God was running a time clock here. Notice that it says, as he promised, a share devar is literally because of the things that he had spoken. That's what it literally says. Ka'asher devar, because of the thing he had spoken. God's word is reliable. When he says it, he will do it. So it was a time of incredible blessing. How many of you think Sarah, after 90 plus years, now being with a baby, walking around, now her laughter wasn't laughter in skepticism. Now her laughter was laughter in laughter. For the first time, she's going out to the well. <laughs> you know, I was like, it's like, you know, Yes, ladies, look at me from the side, you know. And I think she was really excited. I think she waited for a long time for this. Everybody else had the baby and she didn't have a baby. And now it gets to be her moment. I think when you get to verse three, it was also a time of absolute confirmation. The confirmation, Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Yitzhak, Isaac. Laughter. The, the name laughter was both a memory of God's faithfulness and a memory of a rebuke of God. What was, what was the rebuke? Why do you laugh at what I'm saying? Yeah, both Abraham had laughed in 17 and by 18, Sarah's laughing as well. So both of them had laughed at this. The important thing is there was a rebuke, but there was also the faithfulness of God. This time they could laugh and really laugh. Remember 1716 is where God instructed the name, and you might want to write that next to verse 3. 1716 is where God instructed what his name is going to be. Uh, at six, well, actually, 1716 to 19. 1716 to 19 is where God told them what to name him, and in 21:3 is where they did. I think it's probably a good time to stop and make a note on perfect faith here. I, I, Romans 4, verses 13 to 22, Romans 4, 13 to 22, says this. For the promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 4, 18. In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Verse 19, Romans 4, 19. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. Now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Listen to Romans 4, 20. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Paul says he didn't waver. He didn't stop believing. But I read the story and it sure does sound like he stopped believing and he wavered. Is everybody with me? Something's wrong here. It's, it's possible to read the words of Paul and lose the essential point that he's making. You can read his words as though Abraham never wavered for a moment, but that's not true, is it? It's also, Abraham was like the rest of us. Everybody who believes. You could say, I'm a believer. I follow Jesus. Does that mean every moment? Does that mean that there are times in your life that you look back on and go, yeah, I'm a believer, but I just wasn't like those five minutes? Maybe. Ultimately, he shaped his life around the truth of God's word and God's promises. But the fact of the matter is there were lapses in his life. Let me tell you this. When the story is told of your life, it's not going to be of those momentary lapses where you just, where you just were having doubts about something. It's going to be about the big things that, that moved your life. I, I want to say that because I think that some of you have a goal that's not reachable. I think some of you think, boy, if I just learn the Bible, then all of a sudden I will always be faithful to God. No, you will not. You just will feel worse about it. I think one of the things that happens is that we get this unrealistic view of what God is looking for in us. I don't want to ever give you a reason to sin. I don't want you to go, hey, you know, we're all human, so let's just, no, uh, that's not me. I'm not giving you a reason to do wrong. What I am saying is you're going to do wrong. And you need to get past the idea that somehow you're going to climb to perfection, okay? 
I, I mention this because of the sting of the notion that it, it sometimes hooks you. We mature and we learn to trust God. We don't do it all at the same time. One of the things I love about the Gospels is it keeps saying, like in, in Mark's Gospel, and they believed on him. A couple chapters later, and they believed on him. A couple chapters later, and they believed on him. And you're going, I thought they already believed. But belief is in a stable state. Everybody fades. It's like waves. And I'm not trying to make your faith less. I'm trying to say it's realistic to live with waves. Now, I also want you to see in verses 4 and 5, it's also a time of exacting obedience. Exacting obedience. Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old. Check. Good job, Abe. As God had commanded him. Verse 5. Now, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. A hundred years old, and he's circumcising his, his child through his wife. And you got to know that a year before God instructed Abraham and, uh, to, to, to circumcise and to do this, and he is doing exactly what God told him to do. A hundred years old, he's listening. He's on it. This is a time of exacting obedience. And if you go down to verse 6, it's also a time of deep fulfillment. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. Not at me, with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a child? Seriously, in her old age, yet I have borne a son in his, in his old age. The child grew and Sarah weaned and Abraham made a feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. And see, there's no doubt in my mind that the birth of Isaac was the most deeply fulfilling experience that Sarah ever had. Now, the first eight verses set the scene. It ends with a party. She weans the baby, they're having a party, da, da, da. And then we get to nine to 16. Do you feel it? There's this really nice music playing for eight verses. And then you start hearing, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> okay, coming from the back, as strange as it seems, the center of the episode is about Hagar. And look at verses nine and 10. Now, Sarah, saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be heir with my son Isaac. Now, the term mocking is a very interesting Hebrew word, mitzahek. Mitzahek means to play with. You mitzahek soccer. It's a, a game. I don't think he's mocking the child. I think he's playing with the child. But I think he might be playing rough. And I think what she's seeing is, uh-uh, you're not going to be this teenager and this baby be here and then my husband dies and you take control because my son is too young. I think she put it together. And the thing is, it appears to me that jealousy poisoned Sarah and Hagar's relationship back when Hagar had the baby. Remember, when she first gets pregnant, she gets an attitude with Sarah. And I think one of the things that happens is Hagar did not see this coming. I want you to be Hagar for a minute. You, all you did was raise the child. You already left the home, but that didn't work. How come you came back? Because an angel told you to get back. So you went, all right, I'll take my baby and go back. And now you're back. And now that your child is now, years later, your child is a young teen. He's playing with the baby. And the next thing you know, you're in hot water getting kicked out of your tent. What did you do? Nothing. Nothing. I think she was blindfided, blindsided by an old fit of jealousy. I think she didn't see it coming. And I'll tell you why. Abraham didn't do what she thought he was going to do. Look, look, look what happens in verse 11. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. Why is that there? I think it's there to tell you <coughs> that she knew Abraham loved Ishmael. Did he? You bet. When God promised that Isaac would be the one who would carry the blessing, he said, why not Ishmael? He loved Ishmael. I think the more Abraham loved Ishmael, the more Hag Hagar thought she was safe but she wasn't safe. Under the law, Sarah could dismiss Hagar at any moment and out the door goes Ishmael. So they're in a tenuous spot. 
And Abraham's not anxious to let Sarah decide this time because he had years of Ishmael's life. And I think Abraham last time said, look, it's your maid, do whatever you want. This time he knows this baby. He likes this baby. This baby's now a young teen and he is going, no, I really care about this child. This time his heart's tied to the boy. His daily interactions with Ishmael probably offered a level of comfort to Hagar. Every time Abraham was out playing with Ishmael, I think Hagar felt more secure. Don't you think? I'm just trying to work the angles here. Look at verse 12. God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Listen to this. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac your descendants shall be named. And the son of the maid I will make a nation also because he is your descendant. How incredibly confusing this is. I've been telling you since Adam that these guys became lazy and did not lead their home. Now Abraham gets it. He's going to step up. He's going to say, now Sarah, I'm sorry, but the child stays and the mama stays and you get your heart right. And God says, don't. Listen to your wife and let her do, tell you what to do. Is anybody else confused on this point? At this moment, God says, look, I'm not going to wound the child. I got a future for him. Something good is going to happen, but you need to listen to me. Let Sarah make this decision. That is so counterintuitive with everything we've taught up till now. But see, I need you to learn a principle, and I need you to learn it right here. Something is right or wrong because God says it is. The rule isn't God makes a rule and then has to live in it. It's what God says becomes the rule. So for instance, you shall make no graven image, except for if I tell you to put ark, on the ark big angels. Then I want them to look like this. And you go, wait a minute, he said no images. God writes the rules. Dualism is the teaching that there is right and there is wrong and God dwells within what is right. Christian teaching is whatever God says, that's what defines what's right. And whatever God says is wrong is what's wrong. God is bound by nothing. He speaks and that becomes the rule. Thou shalt not kill unless I tell you to. Well, how's that work? Because right isn't the moral statement of no killing. Right is whatever God says. That's why it's fairly important for believers to be able to pick out God's word. Because what you don't want to do is go running down this street because you thought God said when God never said it. There's a whole group of Christians today across Christendom, on Christian television, you'll see them, who run around saying that God said, come to Jesus and you'll get rich. Except for God never said that. Look at this. I think that cruising through life is Hagar. Dee, 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 dee. I don't think she has any idea she's about to get hit by a truck. And, and here's what you see. All of a sudden, God says to Abraham, let Sarah make the decision. Look at verse 14. So Abraham rose up early in the morning, took bread, a skin of water, gave them to Hagar, put, him on, put them on her shoulder, gave her the boy and sent her away. Go! And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. I think that it looked to Hagar like she was fine and then you see him packing up and smacking the back of the donkey and sending her off into the wilderness. Are you kidding me? Did, ladies, can you not feel a little bit of indignance for her? Like, that's just wrong. She didn't do anything. The thing she did wrong was years before. She got, she got snotty with Sarah years before. But now she's not. There's nothing in the text that says she kept a bad attitude. So... Can we all go the next step? It seems like God abandoned her. If you were Hagar, would it look like God gave up and abandoned you? Because that's the way it looks to me. Couldn't have seemed any other way. God told her that her son would be the father of a great nation. God told her to go home. God told her to trust him. She obeyed and now everything went wrong. She was shafted. This is a great story, guys. This is a great story. This is a great story when you're dealing with a youth who just came home whose parents split up and they thought if they walk with God that that wasn't going to happen in their home. This is a great story. You did all the right things and you feel ripped off. But the story often offers even a more specific sense of the drama. Okay, here's, here's how you go. She's alone in the heat of the desert. 
and she has her son. Her canteen dries up. This is the story. She tells her son to sit in the shade of a bush. She, she probably looked confident and she said, I'll be back with some more water. Don't leave. You have to obey or we're both going to die. I can't chase, I can't chase you, I can't find you, so you got to stay right here. She tells the young team something like this was going to be difficult, but that's okay, she could handle it. She probably explains to him, you know, I've been in the desert before, met an angel there, don't worry, we'll be fine. Now listen to the text in verse 15. When the water in the skin was used up, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down. By the way, he's a young teen. He's not a baby, so don't put this baby under this bush. This is a young teen now. And she sat down opposite him. How far away did she sit? A bow shot. A bow shot. About the length you could shoot from the bow. The funny part is he's going to become a hunter. I think that's the point of the story. She goes away about a bow shot in the story, and she said... God, don't let me see this guy die. Don't let me see this boy die. She sat opposite him. She lifted up her voice and she wept. She looked away because she didn't want him to hear. The desert eats sound. I don't know if you've, have any of you ever been out in the desert? The desert actually, you know, do you ever get a ring in your ears? The desert actually rings so loudly it keeps me awake at night. It's so, it's, it eats sound. There's nothing there. It eats the sound. So she's crying. A couple hundred feet away, Hagar's at the despair point, and the boy's sitting over there. Where was God? If he wasn't being cruel, it sure looked like he was being cruel. Here's, here's where he was. God, God was working. He had a point to make. He was going to take care of them with his own hand. Abraham wasn't going to take care of them, but God would. So in 2117, here's the third part. You know, you have the, you have the facing the sting, and now we have the finding the promise. This is the part I wanted to get you to. God's work in the midst of trouble. Guys, you know, I say so many words in the process of one day that when the really important ones come, I, I you know, get afraid it's going to be wah, 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 wah. This is really important. The text is going to open up some truths about meeting God in a crisis place. This is going to happen to you. Hagar is going to be you at some point in your life. You're going to be doing the right thing and get smacked by something and feel like, God, what are you doing? I don't get it. What I'm trying to say is at some point in your life, you're going to wake up having done everything right and feel like a Mack truck hit you and you're wondering why God isn't there. This is the moment you go to 2117. That's what it's for. Put yourself in Hagar's sandals. Wear her toga for a minute. The first thing I want you to see is God heard the lad crying in 17a. Because I want you to understand the perception of God precedes our understanding of what God's doing. God is on the page of what's broke before we even know it. We, we might feel alone, but God hears our cry. He knows where we are. He knows how we got there. And the tears of painful isolation are a tool in the tool chest to help us learn that there are no God-forsaken places. You need to know that. There are people who forsook God, but there are no God-forsaken people. There are places where God would not be welcome, but there are no God-forsaken places. The Torah repeated the instruction to care for the stranger 33 times, far more than any other commandment in the scriptures, because God was trying to get people to be sensitive to the cry of mothers that were in their midst. In other words, if you know anything about God, you know his heart breaks when a child is crying. It does. The point here is that God might use my, my life as a model for somebody else or something else, and maybe it follows my sojourn on the planet. In other words, God may use my life by ending it. I got to tell you something. I don't like this. I'm just telling you what's biblical. I don't write the material. I just teach it. It's not my job to write what's true. It's my job to simply, if the truth has been recorded. I now have to deliver. I'm on my best day a messenger boy. 
And here's the thing. Naomi learned God took away Elimelech, God took away Machlon, God took away Chilion, took away the sons, took away the husband, took away the farm, took away, took away, took away, took away, took away, so that God could bring Ruth and Boaz together and give us King Jesus and later give us King, uh, King David and later King Jesus. And the point of the story is very simple. You don't get to know in your lifetime what God really is doing. Because the play started before you got here and it keeps on going after you're gone. Okay, look at 17 for a second. The angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. I, I want you to notice, heaven but in. That's what it says. When she was broken, heaven but in. God's perspective on things as expressed in his word is not at all like ours. He sees from above. He's the one. We're walking in the parade. He sees above from the blimp, the beginning and the end of the parade, all at one time. The whole course of life is already at one time for him. Now notice in verse 17 it says, He said to her, What is the matter with you? This is a malach. It's a very common Hebrew phrase. Malach. What's wrong with you? Hello? What's up? In the presence of God, we're urged to answer for ourselves. So I want you to listen. It says, um, The first step to pressing us toward him is seeing his plan. So what does he do? God calls her for an assessment and a reflection before he gives her a blessing. All right, so uh, fill me in, Hagar. How's it going, Hag? What's, what, 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 what's happening? The thing is, she doesn't know what's going wrong. You, you got that, right? She has no idea what this is about. All she knows is her heart is being broken and she doesn't know why. I think what's interesting is that, what's the matter with you? What, what's wrong? Do not fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. I think one of the things is that we need to see our own condition, and some people never stop reflecting on what they're doing. Guys, I don't know if this is clear to you, and if it's not, maybe this will help. You know, a lot of your friends are racing like crazy because they never stop to actually think about what life is really about. Days go into weeks, go into months, go into careers, go into marriages, go into babies, go into whatever, and they never stop to think what's life about. Do you know what a midlife crisis is? It's a point where somebody looks in the mirror and says, really? I'm more than halfway through and this is all I got? It's a moment of reflection in a sea of busyness. That's what it is. And I think that a lot of people keep themselves, the modern family has gotten crazy. Monday night is baseball, Tuesday night is ballet, Wednesday night, you know, and, and you can barely keep up. And here's the thing, we're running at a pace. Why? Because some people are afraid to stop and look at their life and decide whether or not it's actually worth living. And the truth is that God says, hey, can you tell me what's happening with you, Hagar? Just give me a little report. There's a fable of a dog who could not stand for another dog to get the best of him in any way. One day the dog came across a large juicy steak that had somehow fallen off a meat wagon. So he picked up the steak and he started running with it. And all, the, all was going pretty well. He was running across the bridge with water underneath. He noticed that there was uh, under the bridge another dog with a big steak in his mouth. He began to growl. And it looked as though the dog that was below the bridge was growling back at him. He got so upset that he went over to the edge of the bridge and he began to bark. And when he opened his mouth, the stake fell out into the river and sank to the bottom and was never seen again. It was about that time he recognized that the dog he was looking at was a reflection of himself. And the point is that God might need to move us to a place where we're unable to see anything but him. And I think Hagar got everything stripped out of her hands and is sitting in the desert because that's where it was obvious that when God spoke, it was him and not someone else. Abraham never took care of Hagar. God always did. He may have used Abraham, but it was always God. I think we get into the idea that our job takes care of us. It doesn't. God does. Your job is just the mechanism. Okay? I'm not against jobs. I'm, for, I'm very pro-job. Get a job. To make money. But 
that's not how you actually live. Man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by the promises that come from God's word. So it's interesting to me when it says, do not fear. God has heard, heard the voice of the lad where he is. The power of God extends into our specific weaknesses and needs. He knows exactly where we are. And then it says, arise, lift up the lad, hold him by the hand, for I will make a great nation of him. He's not saying pick up the baby. He's saying grab the hand of your teenager and pull him up. Stand there and look at him for a minute. Hold his hand. I'm going to make of him a great nation. You know, God uses object lessons all the time to teach us. And I think, I think that God said, grab the hand of your kid, pull him up and stand there and look at him so you can figure out what I'm doing. Does this boy look like he's going nowhere? And I think she was able to look at him and go, no. It looks like you've already brought him this far. We never had anything. I came into this as a maidservant with no baby. I left with this young man who's going to be a nation. In other words, pick up your head. The provision of God's assured when we follow his plan. Look at verse 19. God opened her eyes. She saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. Okay, I want you to make a note. If you don't make a note here, make it on your heart in verse 19. Right there on your heart. In pain, we don't see what's in front of us. When we're in pain, all of a sudden, stuff that's been provided by God disappears. Let me say it this way. He breaks up with you and you sob as though you have no best friends. The fact is you do have best friends, but you can't see them right then. And you don't want them in your life. You want him. And the problem is, I don't know why we do it, but I'm telling you, when we go through pain, we look right past what God has given us toward what we don't have. And we are fixated on the hole. All we can see is the hole, not the donut, just the hole. Ah, oh, donuts. Oh, never mind. <laughs> faith is the ability to see what God says is. God restores her faith, and then she sees the well. And, and the way to blessing is sometimes down a lonely path of pain, and sometimes isolation for a period. But here's the thing you have to understand. Verse 20, God was with the lad. He grew. He lived in the wilderness, and he became an archer. And that's the bow shot reference earlier. He lived in the wilderness of Paran. By the way, the wilderness of Paran, unbelievably. Think Afghanistan, okay? <laughs> Seriously. Um, and, his, and his mother took a wife for him, him from the land of Egypt, which, by the way, is where she was from. So she felt like she could get back to some kind of life and have a future. The, the, the whole point of the story is, guys, um, don't get so caught up in the mechanics you missed this. I, I want to be careful with you because some of you came from backgrounds where you honestly were taught, follow Jesus and life will be wonderful. I'm going to say follow Jesus and you get Jesus. And life is whatever it is, but it's with Jesus. Okay? It'll always be with Jesus. How do I know? Because he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He won't turn his back on you. And if hard things come into your life, he's got a plan. He's working a plan. Stay with him. Don't let go. And by the way, when you do let go, he doesn't. Neither can any man pluck you out of my father's hand. You didn't do anything to earn the relationship with Jesus, but you have one. And because you have one, here's what I want you to know. Stop looking for anything else to be the prize. The prize is Jesus. That's what it is. I just, I just really want him to be in my life. And I want to be so comfortable with him in my life that I'm making daily decisions and choices that make him happy. Not because I live under this, I got to follow Jesus. You know, honestly, there's a lot of Christians. I have decided to follow Jesus. And here's the thing. I want you to back off for a second. Jesus decided to walk into my life and make me something. And now I want to walk with him. That's Christianity.